Good evening. Yes, I talk very fast, but I will try to, to, to do a little bit slower. It's going to be in a completely different story because I am a social scientist working in Wageningen, working in uh, communication science. We uh, closely cooperate with, uh, uh, with uh, uh, the technical scientists here in Wageningen and outside, and uh, we do have quite some exciting conversations. And that's in general to prevent and to define and solve problems to develop innovation, what we all do here in Wageningen, to co-create, which is very uh, hipster now, and to evaluate everyday numerous people are involved in numerous conversations, right? You all are, I, I, I suppose. And people who, who call themselves managers, their work is for 80% is just having conversations. So that's a lot. And in case problems become really serious and complex, then we even think a conversation is not good enough, then we want a dialogue. That's also very fashionable to talk about dialogues, right? I think you all hear that word, and especially also here in Wageningen. Um, think of issues related to refugees, to the radicalization of youngsters going to Syria, complex life science problems so, such as uh, obesity, and also climate change related issues, we really want to have a dialogue because these are complex problems in which many, many different people, different people with different backgrounds and different interests are involved. And in one way or another, they have to come together to a solution. So it's quite surprising, you could say, that people in general and communication uh, professionals, uh, practitioners uh, in particular, that they hardly pay any attention to the quality of our conversations. Whereas they play such a big role in both formal and informal organizational settings. So that's, that's quite surprising. And especially because uh, research, we do study conversations in our group, and that shows that we are not really good in conversations. And you know, I will, in my talk, I will share with you some ideas how we can explain that. We are not good in terms of the discrepancy between what people want to achieve in the, con in the conversation and how the conversation in the end evolves. So that's why we, they are not really always so uh, successful. And um, um, how can we understand this? How can we understand why these uh, this, this, this conversations are not always going so well? Well, what you are doing then, and that's what we do, you study conversations. What is going on actually in conversations? And for instance, how are opinions and facts, because these are many times are the, uh, let's say, the, 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 the issue of conflict, how are they constructed in conversations? And what patterns in conversations um, can be recognized? And what are the consequences of these patterns? Th that is the kind of research that I do. And um, uh, what we do is really uh, studying real life conversations and see what's going on in the interaction and whether we can find some patterns that could explain why conversations about complex problems such as climate change are so, so difficult. And I will now briefly discuss these patterns, these mechanisms that we found in conversations and that you will probably all uh, recognize because we, you have conversations uh, very much uh, experience with conversations as well. So these are these mechanisms. It's about perceptions and framings, bonding and silencing, listening strategies and uh, dichotomization. When it comes to perceptions and framings, then we have to realize when, when people hear something, when we observe something, when we see something, then we immediately tend to, to have an interpretation of what we see or hear, right? That's what we do. We immediately construct a story from what we see or from what we hear. In a story in terms of we have a cause and we have a consequence. You saw also uh, Rul really searching for causes. Eh? That was mainly what he, he was, uh, his presentation was about. So we really want to know the cause in order to solve the problem uh, or whatever, to, 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 to make sense of what is going on. Could also be a story in terms of having a begin, 
a middle and an end, and then this happened, and then that happened. So we, we connect all kinds of facts of little events to one big story. And that we do not need lots of information to do that. We construct stories out of few information. And what we don't know, the information what is lacking, we just fill in. And we construct the story by connecting the little bit of information that we have to our own assumptions, to our own images, hearsayings, our experiences, etc. <coughs> That's what we do, right? I think you all recognize that. Eh? Later on, we are not sure, we don't know, and we even don't think about what we know and what we simply invented eh, to make our story. Because we immediately make a story out of our observations, um, our observations are not very precise. It's on the contrary. The stories that we make, they are in fact always incomplete because we can't see everything and we can't hear everything. And in many cases, even incorrect. So that's already when it comes to per perceptions and framing. We are talking and we are constructing stories that in most cases are incomplete and many times also incorrect. So that makes already a, 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 a conversation between people who fundamentally differ in opinion very, very uh, difficult. You can understand that. So this counts for our own uh, contribution to the conversation, but also for the contributions of others. Moreover, the first interpretation we make is in most cases considered as the one and only possible interpretation, right? We stop thinking. From the moment we have an interpretation, we think, okay, this is it. That's what Herbert Simon, which is a psychologist, called bounded rationality. Yeah? We stop thinking after we have one interpretation. So, and then what we, con what we observe and consider important or crucial is not just like that, it's not trivial in that sense. It has to do, what we know, the, con the stories we construct, have to do with what we already know, our own experiences, as well as our expectations. So I give you an example. Um, this is an, uh, a picture, and this is, wh what do we see? I think that's obvious what we see, isn't it? We see a couple loving each other, right? We all see that? Yeah, but you can see many more things in this picture. And when you show this picture to children, for instance, until six years old, they do that, with, they, they study that, they use this picture in research, until six years old, children would say, I see fishes. I think we all see the fishes. We probably most of you know this picture because it's a well-known picture. We see, who sees the fishes? Oh, who don't? The rest don't? Oh, that's quite some. Well. Just forget about the man and the woman. I know it's difficult, but you should try. And just think in terms of black and white spots. Then you see in the middle, you see black spots. And they have the form of fishes, of dolphins. You see? Everybody sees it? Yeah? So the interesting thing is that um, adults, like we all are, that we immediately see the man and the, and the woman, whereas children immediately see the fishes. It's interesting, right? That really shows that what we see, that really relates d directly to what we have in our mind, our exper experiences and also our expectations. Research also shows that men in, generally, in general have more difficulties to discover the fishes. <laughs> I don't know. I don't <laughs> So in short, the stories we share in conversations, they are incomplete and in some, in some cases also incorrect. And that has to do with the fact that we immediately make these stories and focus on what we already know and what we expect, right? And the question is then, why do we immediately make a story? Well, and that has to do with the fact that when you see something or when you hear something, it's impossible to see all the signals and all the information that surrounds us. That's simply impossible. And um, it's also not possible to make all the decisions we have to make in a day. We make a lot of decisions from the moment we get out of our bed till we go to sleep again. We make numerous of these decisions and we can't 
deliberate every de de every decision, right? We m a lot of decisions we make just automatically, eh? very, very quickly, making immediately an interpretation and decide, right? I think we all recognize that. And that's um, explained by this guy, Daniel Kahneman, who is a psychologist, who won one time the Nobel Prize, and he, put, he, ma he wrote this book, Thinking Fast and Slow, um, nice book, I think, and in this uh, it's about decision-making. How do people make decisions? And Kahneman says, we have to make decisions, we have two systems. And one system is the system of the really the fast decisions we make, the automatic decisions. When you are driving a car, you go automatically, you move through the traffic, and the only moment that you are really alert is when something unexpected comes up, eh? so that's what we do. And most of our decisions we take in a day, they are automatically. They go according to the system one. But sometimes we have things that we really have to deliberate. When I, for instance, ask you wh how much is 24 times uh, 117, most of you will have to deliberate a little bit and maybe even use a sort of uh, model to know uh, what it is, which is uh, 2,808. But <laughs> <laughs> so we do need system two in order to think about, to, to, to consider uh, more complex problems, right? So we have these two systems. Kahneman says the problem now is that this system two is just as water, as we learned uh, while having dinner tonight, is very lazy. The system two is very lazy, so the system of you know thinking and deliberating is lazy, and try, tends to throw everything, the decisions, to this system one, which means <coughs> that we much more often decide according to system one than we in fact should do. We think we have a very great intuition, but research shows that that's not the case. <laughs> <laughs> in many cases, we are simply we are simply wrong. So this also shows that you know, we should, in fact, be much more alert, be critical towards our own stories and also those of others. And the problem is that we find that very difficult. And one of the reasons is that um, our fast interpretations, in more most cases, they are not simply individual interpretations. Although we think we are very individual, strong, rational decision makers, we are not at all. And now I come to the second mechanism, that's called bonding and silencing. And that's about the fact that people are social beings, right? We continually want to, to have conversations with others because that fulfills our fundamental need to belong to others. Uh, we are really social beings. And Research also shows that people prefer to talk with people who are the same. We like like-minded people, our sort of people. And that doesn't sound very nice, but it is actually the truth. And I think we all recognize that. You know, these people who say, I can talk to this person one word enough, you know? And that's the people, they are like-minded. We like that very much. And this is the connections with like-minded people. That's what we call bonding in relation to bridging. This guy, Robert Putnam, he's a sociologist, he wrote this book, Bowling Alone, which is about the connections between people. And he distinguishes bonding from bridging. And bonding is the connections between like-minded people. That doesn't need much encouragement, because we really like that, we prefer that. And bridging is the connection between people who think differently. <coughs> we find that difficult. And I will, I will say a little bit more about that. So, we think we make our decisions, you know, autonomously, that we, uh, that we, have, uh, uh, that we are very individual and also very rational. That's how we are all the time approached as well. Uh? People, especially scientists, when they think, uh, uh, they all the time when you, they try to explain it again, they, 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 they approach, other people like rational individual thinkers that make their individual um, decisions. But that's not true because also when it comes to our ideas or about whatever, we tend to imitate other people and we tend to conform to, to other people. And 
that also um, we tend to, to take into account what we think that people who are important for us think. And um, there is the fact that we imitate and conform is, for instance, very um, well, this is the bonding and the bridging. Bonding is the bonding within the network and bridging between different networks. Eh? And the fact that we are really conforming is also see, you can also see that in fashion. This is fashionable. I don't know whether you see that, but men in the latest years, they prefer to have beards, aren't they? And they may all think that they made this decision very rational individually, but it's just fashion. Like also uh, women um, follow fashion, but men as well. But it's not only fashion that we imitate and conform, it's also other types of behaviors, smoking, eating, hobbies, holiday net destinations, ideas, impressions and opinions about climate change and how to deal with that. By imitating and conforming, by bonding uh, in, in, the, in the networks, we construct the networks of people that gradually become even more lookalikes, right? Because we tend to to, 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 to go along with like-minded people, then we share our ideas, our behaviors, and etc. And then they become even more like-minded. And that's because behavior, including ideas and opinions, is very, very contagious. So that's all written down in this book, which is called Connection, the surprising power of how of our social networks and how they shape our lives. <laughs> eh? it's, uh, it's about um, how people, you know, let's say, constantly imitate each other and show behavior in groups more than they show it individually. And of course we know that, but we do not take that very often into account. And we do not realize what this all means for having conversations. Eh? So these networks, they are very important for developing these common opinions that uh, become gradually, within this like-minded group, uncontested. So they become uncontested, so to speak, facts, as they are among the people from the, from the network, not very easily contested. And also, even by people who may not agree, because that's what we call the pressure of the group. When all people think in the same way, it's very hard to, to, to say that you don't agree, because people are very, very afraid that they then are kicked out of the group. Eh? That's the group thing coming up. So that makes this kind of, that's the silencing that plays a role. And this bonding and silencing makes that, in fact, um, the truth, what we consider to be the truth, results from discussions with our friends. And this is not new, because this is David Hume, is a very old, uh, Scottish uh, philosopher who said that centuries ago, uh, ago already, uh, and we should, I think we should really realize that. And of course there are facts and truths that are um, quite uncontested and also agreed upon uh, by people belonging to different networks. For instance, what uh, Rule was saying, the amount of floods and all these figures and numbers and facts that he presented, they are, of course, they, they can be uncontested. Eh? Or they can, at least, they can be widely agreed upon. But the fact is that from the moment these facts are discussed by groups of people who are involved in this complex problem, then um, we make all kinds of interpretations about the causes, for instance. Eh? And from different perspectives and different backgrounds and with different, um, different uh, interests, the facts, they are judged in a completely different way. Eh? We can agree upon the temperature in this room, because especially when it's measured by a thermometer or so. But whether we feel it as cold or warm, or what it means for whatever, that's absolutely an interpretation. And it's very hard sometimes to distinguish the facts from the opinions and from the interpretations. And in many, many cases, we treat opinions and interpretations as facts. And in these interpretations, we can all the time find a sort of hidden norms, what we call hidden norms, assumptions, desires and expectations. You hear uh, rules saying, okay, what is extreme flood? 
And then he says, you know, that's what is not normal anymore. And then he says, what is not normal is that I don't want to live in a street with so many, much water, you know. That's not normal. Eh? So you can't call this a fact. It is an interpretation and it's, you could say it's, it's, uh, it's a sort of uh, uh, opinion. Eh? So, in fact, this is, this realizing this, then we should, in fact, really uh, listen much better to our uh, conversation partners. Eh? And then we come uh, to, the, to the, the next mechanism, that is the listening strategies. And this is really something, because we see in our research that listening is very, very difficult. Um, we are not good in it. And there is one guy, I just want to share that with you, that's Otto Scharmer, he's a German guy, and he did a lot of research to listening strategies. He was, let's say, analyzing like thousands of conversations in orga organizations, and based on that, he made a categorization on listening. He distinguished different types of listening. And the first one he calls downloading. And downloading means that you listen and just select what you already know or what already is your opinion. That really fits the bonding, right? And Scharmer says, more than 80% from our listening is downloading. That's a lot, isn't it? You can also listen in an object-focused way. And that means that you listen and really try to, to focus on what you did not your know yet. We think we do that often, but we don't. Most of the time you don't do that. You know we, who are good object-focused listeners? Children. They always want to know more, new things, as if their heads is still, you know, empty and has to be filled. Eh? But most adults, they are, I'm sorry to say, bad listeners. Then you have empathic listening, and that's listening in such a way to the other person, really respect different opinions and try to grasp why this person is thinking as he thinks or she, without having any judgment. That's extremely difficult. Coaches learn to listen empathically and it takes them four years of full-time studying to do that with no guarantee that they will be empathic listening listeners when they are involved in the in in, in 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 the conversation themselves right so that's really really difficult instead what we see when we meet people in conversations who think differently eh, it's it's quite rare that people then say this is interesting you have a completely different opinion. Tell me, I want to hear that. No, we don't do that. Instead, we go and we say, we try to convince the other party to come to our camp. Isn't that true? Because we feel a little bit uncomfortable when people have different opinions, which often ha happens, of course, when we are having a conversation about complex problems, such as, for instance, climate change issues. So we try to convince the other party, and I can indeed talk for hours about the strategies that we use to convince the other party. For instance, we refer to facts. That's what experts do. Research shows. Eh? Or we refer to very personal um, um, experiences. You know, I saw it with my own eyes, which is difficult then to contest, right? Or we are using disclaimers. I'm not a feminist, but... And then I go, you know, talking about what all these men and blah, blah, blah. So <laughs> these are all kinds, um, or, or we use very strong adjectives, eh? that's also something, or very strong metaphors, just to, to make our argument stronger. All kinds of, um, of, of, of uh, um, all kinds of strategies we use. And the sad thing is that all these strategies, instead of convincing the people, they, the distance between the conversation partis, partners becomes become even bigger. People you can get people silent, yeah, but not in a way that they will agree with you. Do you recognize that? I think so. Eh? The inclination to do that, but also a little bit with the sad result of that. It's only in <laughs> very, very rare cases that people really are convinced by these kind of strategies. And still we do it all the time. So, this kind of, um, and this was the dichotomization that when people are talking that, you know, with this convincing strategies, we get even more polarization and dichotomization. So the conclusion must be that all these mechanisms, in fact, they refer to one 
uh, one single problem. And the problem is that not the differences between people, when they think differently about th something, they are the problem, but how we deal with that. How we deal with differences in conversations, that's the core problem, you could say. It's our inclination to start from a one and only truth, our truth. And the others are wrong. And that's what we really find very difficult. Very difficult. So in that sense, we can still learn to have uh, better conversations, and especially when we want to call a conversation a dialogue. Because a dialogue uh, asks for all kinds of methods that help us to, to think together and to, let's say, to, to develop new kinds of thoughts that sort of connect the different truth of all the people involved. So the characteristics of a dialogue is, in the first place, is to recognize different truths. That is that we should, should accept when I'm right, that doesn't mean that you are wrong. You know, we have different perspectives and we can all be right, so to speak. But we should explore each other's perspective. Why is this other person thinking as he or she is thinking and saying, what he or she is, uh, is saying. So that's what we find very difficult, but that's the, in one of the most important preconditions for having a good conversation. We should also critically reflect on our own conversational behavior. Are the stories that we now bring to the fore, are they really true? Aren't we a little bit exaggerating? Eh? And maybe we can also reflect on possible assumptions of ourselves and of the others. And maybe when we do that, then we find common ground, ground much better than if we don't do that. Starting from how people actually behave in conversations, because in conversations we not only share uh, information eh, or content, we also organize our identities, eh, the need to belong and the need to distinguish ourselves from others. That's all what we do in conversations, and that's a lot. So conversations, in fact, are very complex things in which people do all kinds of things. Eh? And when we try to do that, then I think we should work together to viable solutions. Not because we all agree, because that's sometimes really difficult, but at least we could explore um, our the different truths, the different perspectives, and come to a sort of, let's say, what we, are, we also call overlapping consensus. So that's a consensus that at least gives a sort of basis for uh, thinking together about possible solutions. You don't have to agree about everything to agree about a solution that we can all live for, live with. So to my opinion, to make the world a better place, to, to improve the quality of life, so to speak, um, to fight negative consequences of climate change, whatever, I think we should invest in learning the art of thinking together, in learning the art of dialogue. And I think also scientists should learn to get involved in discussions with their facts and not closing the discussion with their facts, because that's how scientists, many cases, um, uh, let's say, how they position themselves in discussions. These are the facts, and you have to live with it, like the rijdende rechter, so we say. Um, so, but scientists should bring in their facts and their information and, let's say, use them in order to start the discussion instead of closing it. I think that would be the lesson for all of us. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.